Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel almost embarrassed that I stay with these low-level things after all these years and other people are doing high-level fancy stuff. But at any rate, you know, virtual memory, it's amazingly old idea. There's a few ideas in computing where I always feel like, wouldn't it have been great to have come up with that idea? And I think virtual memory is a great, great idea. And, you know, I think memory, the importance of memory is kind of underappreciated in computing that, you know, if you actually read things like uh, Maurice Wilkes wrote this book called Memoirs of a Computer Pioneer. And, you know, what's striking, I read it from front to back at one point, what's uh, striking, that's the usual order, isn't it? Front to back, right. Uh, but what's striking about it is that we bumble along in each decade and memory kicks us forward, you know. I mean, any idiot can come up with all sorts of fancy programs to do stuff, but if nothing will run it, then you can't do it. And so I think it's an incredibly enabling thing. So I've been interested in this area. Um, so obviously we know all these trends. You know, it's amazing what hardware has accomplished. Uh, you know, more cores, DRAM's gotten larger, um, dramatically larger. I mean, it's funny, I find it hard to thinking back to the time I was in Waterloo, you know, that I find it hard to even say these words like, well, we had this system with 16 kilobytes of memory on it. Like, you know, is that really possible you could actually do something in 16 kilobytes? So it's unbelievable how much things have gotten larger, but one thing to pay attention to is DRAM's focus on capacity as commodity market and doesn't seem much prospect of it going faster. Um, and then, of course, application data sets have grown huge, and uh, um, you know the compute requirements have increased, and so on. And as you get into this world, people are interested in fault tolerance. That is, things get bigger, larger, more complicated, and things fail, and it takes longer for things to recover if you have to just restart everything from zero. So fault tolerance is important. And I don't know whether it's now 50 or 60 years old, but you know it's old, old, old. And you know I think we've we've uh, you know again gone through phase where things have changed by amazing orders of magnitude. And um, the uh, you know across a number of different dimensions. Uh, I remember several years ago saying to somebody at Google that, you know, we needed to think about terabyte memories, and he said, well, we already are. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, and it's easy to say these terms, but it's, you know, it really changes uh, a bunch of the properties. One of the other things that I think has been interesting is paging storage has lagged tremendously, and uh, I think this 3D crosspoint technology out of Intel, um, I'm not going to market it, even though I have this Intel affiliation, but it's pretty interesting how much that has changed what's possible with paging storage. Of course, network performance has gone up, core counts increased, and no engineering design survives this level of change. And I think we've not paid enough attention to this wonderful idea of virtual memory that's old but needs some rethinking here. Now, in the world of scaling things up, I think we're caught in sort of a bit of a painful dichotomy right here where we're trying to use this multi-core stuff because we banged into this limit that you can make faster cores, it's just that they consume more energy, which means that you can have fewer cores and you're caught in this power heat envelope thing that I don't know much about, but Intel people tell me about. And, you know, it's a problem. So we've kind of run out of steam, except if we go to more and more cores. So parallelism is part of the story here, and, um, you know, it makes the world more complicated. Uh, and so when you go parallelism on applications, you need shared state, and you need this fault tolerance as things get larger. So um, what's the dichotomy I see is that you have database parallelism. Databases are wonderful uh, because you can have all these separate processes that are doing application stuff. Uh, the compute guys, and they're sort of stateless in a curtain, certain sense that they don't store any important state. It's the database that stores the important state, and the database handles all the sharing, handles all this concurrency. And so to the degree that the database is reliable, fault tolerant, and so on, 
uh, you solve your problem because all your complex logic is running in these application processes. It's just that it's expensive sharing because you have this inter-process communication overhead where everybody talks to the database, the database talks to everybody, and you have the memory overhead of moving things back and forth, and the memory is the bottleneck with processing speed. So it's leaning on the, the most scarce resource in effect. Now, the multi-threaded parallelism gets rid of this problem. You say, well, hey, we've got this technology for years. You just have a bunch of processes map in the same uh, application or the shared state and so on. You can have this as multiple threads running the same address space. So you have very efficient access to this shared state. There's no duplication of the state, but there's also no fault tolerance because you run into this problem that if one of these guys screws up, the whole application can end up with corrupted data and it dies. So is there another choice here? And so my favorite number is three, so <laughs> it should be a third alternative. Uh, and uh, so I've been working on a project with a PhD student, which he decided to call Thistle, and I think it's actually an acronym, but I can't remember what it stands for. So um, at any rate, so Ben Brown's been working on this, and the idea is to extend virtual memory to be transactional. So again, we have the choice. You can have multi-threaded, you can have separate processes, database. And this says, well, you can have this shared state, but run with separate processes, and you coordinate by using transactions on this. Now, uh, and trying to do this through the virtual memory system. So it's not something that is implemented by the uh, application. So the picture kind of looks like this, where you say, I have these different processes, this terrible graphics still, <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, process I and process J are running in separate virtual address spaces, so they're protected from each other, and so they can fail independently, except they're mapping in shared state through this transactional file mechanism, and this is just using standard Unix, Linux kind of capability of M mapping in things. Um, except, what do we do here? We add this uh, layer on top, which is the thistle layer, which is just a transactional layer built on top of the normal file systems. And there's, there's a whole flock of file systems that have been developed for Linux and so on, and a lot of technology there that we don't want to duplicate. We don't have to. So in this world, we're using MMAP to give you direct access to data and so on. You're running as multiple processes. So, well, so I guess I should say it's the same as a, a multi-threaded process. It's just that it's transactionally updated. And so what that means is that um, until you commit the transaction, it's not visible. So I guess it's just another picture that shows typical address space where you have a stack, you have private heap, you have code, and then you have this portion that's mapped. And this is one of the other things, anybody that's followed all this effort that's gone on the past, boy, 15 years on transactional memory, they've often taken kind of a hardware-centric view of taking the whole memory and saying it all has to be transactional, whereas database people have always been more sensible where they say, some of this stuff is your business, and it's only the stuff that you store in the database, and when you get it there, when you commit it, when it's really solid. So an application has to deal with some of this stuff itself. We're taking the same database thinking to this. It's only the stuff that's stored in these special segments where we're applying the transactional semantics. And, you know, it's amazing sometimes you can have the right solution taken too broadly doesn't work when you focus it down to what it really needs to solve. Uh, it works much better. So one of the other aspects here, uh, another idea I wish I'd been the one who thought of this was this whole snapshot isolation model of transactions where it's uh, rather than, it's not providing strict serializability, but it's a pretty uh, attractive model, and this is essential, I think, for making the virtual memory system support this. And the idea is that each pr uh, process gets a snapshot of the current state. And of course, this sounds horrible if you have a terabyte of data 
data set to give everybody their own copy, but of course we're playing virtual memory tricks on, under the, the covers where uh, you're actually sharing all the data that's in common and only getting separate copies of the things you actually write. So in this world, when you have your own copy, you sit there in complete isolation, even though you're accessing shared data logically. Uh, you have a snapshot, you read this at hardware speed, that is, you know, the usual virtual memory access through TLBs to DRAM and so on, um, and you write the same rate and so on. And it's only on commit you pay the cost of this, where this is detecting write-write conflicts on commit, so there's a lot of thistle logic that takes place at the point you're actually doing the locking, or the commit, rather. So this is a different model than the conventional uh, two-phase locking kind of transactional support, and it doesn't seem feasible to do this in the operating system if you're taking a locking approach, because the you know, virtual memory system, the operating system doesn't know the structure of your data structures, any of that sort of stuff. So um, it doesn't seem feasible to do that, whereas with snapshot isolation, it becomes feasible. So in this world, the way we get to fault tolerance, of course, is that um, you have these separate processes, so a process can fail and restart, it doesn't affect the others, but the key thing is that when it fails, any uncommitted writes just disappear because it's working on its own snapshot of things. And, um, and so it's only once you commit, and the commit is designed, of course, to detect write-write conflicts and resolve things so that it uh, leaves the state consistent. Um, and then with fault tolerance, of course, you're maintaining all this shared state, so uh, recovery is fairly quick. And uh, you know the applications we've worked on, it's in milliseconds. So you know large applications, like if you imagine you're working on a large data set, if it's a multi-threaded thing, you have to restart the whole thing. You can talk about minutes, even hours, in some cases, to reload this data set that may have been corrupted here. Individual processes fail. You just restart them, and they're back on the air pretty quickly. And you know, it's uh, found it amazing in, in work I've done primarily in industry where fast restart means that you can get away with a lot of sins, <laughs> you know, that, uh, you know, uh, failures that you can recover from. You can actually, if you recover in milliseconds, you can have applications that are deployed that are restarting continuously and in the, the users don't, don't, aren't even aware that these are happening, so it, it opens up, uh, it simplifies a, a lot of things. So um, in terms of further fault tolerance, the log can be piped off to a separate host, so you can recover if a whole host fails, you're uh, piping off the log. So this is the basic idea, so why don't we make virtual memory transactional in this sense? Um, well, you might say, well, because what's the performance look like? Well, again, uh, I guess here's a little slide that shows how it fits in here. But there's a bunch of stuff going on in there um, that, you know, where we're committing and we're sending checkpoints and so on. So there's not a lot of innovation. I mean, there's a sort of fairly standard database -y type structure to this, uh, at least for a snapshot isolation kind of mode. So performance evaluation, excuses, excuses, it's still a work in progress. And I think we could say, I mean, reads are really cheap in this world because you're going directly to memory you get, and no interference here. Um, and we're certainly seeing some slowdowns for write intensive applications and you know the usual optimistic concurrency approaches. If there's a lot of conflicts, uh, there's a lot of aborts and so on. So. Uh, but that's, I mean, with lock-based approaches of a lot of conflicts, then you run into a lot of slowdown as well. So, uh, so I think we've tried to look at this uh, as a comparison to some of the other approaches, like there is software transactional memory. Uh, I think some of the comparisons we've done is to look at uh, things that are not quite fair comparisons. But let me go on to these. So. Looking at, I always like to, everybody likes to present the good results first, of course. So this uh, thistle is the purple line with the crosses on it. 
across kind of get lost in this picture here. There's custom locking, which is, you know, writing the data structure where you say, well, I read this book where Don Knuth figured out you could put the lock here and there and so on. And uh, multi-version is the software implementation that is doing it right in the application and doing multi-version uh, updates and so on. Uh, then uh, this is uh, two-phase locking. Uh, software or, or snapshot isolation, and this is a sort of a simple version of software transactional memory in the conventional sense, and two-phase locking. So, so on on uh, on the read-intensive workloads, we do really well because our reads are fast; they're not instrumented. There's no locking to do with reads, and so on. All that goes away. What we're still working on is that as you introduce writes into this picture, things get a little worse. And you notice that thistle here with the purple with the, the crosses on it is, this is measure uh, looking at speed up here. So higher is better. And it's not always the highest thing on the, on the picture. And so uh, you know, one way to interpret this is to say, well, geez, it's not working very well, or it's not competitive when the, uh, there's higher write rates and so on. Um, I guess, you know, I'd make the standard excuse that we're still working on improving that. But the other standpoint is that, you know, this is comparison with things that don't provide the fault tolerance. So I think to some degree, you start seeing the cost of fault tolerance here, and it makes, you can imagine looking at this from the standpoint that says, well, if you take the extreme, you say, I'm running these applications that don't modify this data set at all. There's no consistency problem. There's no read for any of this sort of stuff. So fault tolerance is trivial in that case. It's just that most applications need to modify things because what are they doing <laughs> otherwise? Uh, even if they're transferring to some other common uh, you know, data set, reading one big thing, modifying another, there's still shared data and it's still being modified. So I think that what we're seeing here is potentially sort of a sense that you know, fault tolerance doesn't come for free and, and start quantifying this effect. So um, one of the other things that fascinated me is, again, I've got this funny position at Intel, so I'm sort of up close and personal with some of the problems. And, and you know, you look at the hardware level coherency, and you know, hardware people use the word coherency, and thank God they use that instead of consistency, because what does it mean? Well, hardware coherency is word level consistency. It says, well, we'll impose a total ordering on write. So if you write to this location, I write on two different cores, we're going to order those writes. Well, you know. The hardware people say, this is great. We did a great job. The trouble is, this is expensive. It's getting more expensive because you have coherency runs across all these cores. And it's a nightmare. You know, you go between sockets in particular, but even within one core, uh, even within one processor chip. But the kicker is, you say, well, it's expensive. It's getting worse. But it's nowhere adequate for software, right? I mean, we, don't, we can't build data structures, and we can't do sensible updates but by ordering things at a word level. We need to order things at much larger scales. So you think, well, why do these hardware guys provide something that's expensive but not adequate for software? <laughs> well, if you look at the, uh, the alternative, once you say transactional memory, you say, well, I, we have to impose detect conflicts at this higher level, namely in the transactional level. So we need this in any case. And then we don't actually need the hardware coherency at all if we're running in this transactional mode. Now, uh, and this is kind of interesting because you know it's a classic case you see so often in computing where if you solve something at the higher level, it obviates the need for a lot of complication at the lower level. Now, there's a few kickers in this. like. Right now, we have this crazy behavior where you know, you're, you're checking coherency across all these cores. And yet, if this guy is running on one core with his own snapshot of things, there's no reason. Like, if I do a write, I don't have to worry about anybody else coherent with anybody else because the snapshot isolation, whereas the hardware is doing all this work. 
The one kicker which comes to this operating system changes is that right now you can have the operating system say, ah, why don't I schedule on you this different core? And suddenly the coherency that's required is because you say, well, I left my data over there. <laughs> I need to, you know, I need to invalidate that copy to bring it over here. So if we didn't have the operating system moving things around and we just flush the cache when you actually move something, then you don't need the hardware coherency. So uh, I haven't convinced Intel of this, of course, but you know, uh, I think that some point, I think this is gonna have to give. So let me wrap up by saying, you know, we're in the midst of this, but, you know, major rethink is probably an overstatement, but academics are good at that. But, you know, this, this way of just adding in transactions and, you know, viewing, we have to, as far as I can see, go to a snapshot isolation model of transactions significantly changes the way you can actually run this and it's dealing with exactly this problem that the scale up has meant we can't afford failures but we're gonna have them unless we have fault tolerance and that we have the sharing going on. So putting these two together I think solves a significant problem for software but also some degree it solves a problem for hardware, I think, by saying you don't need this lower level mechanism which doesn't scale. So let me stop there and uh, invite any questions. Are there questions for David Oh, come on, you guys. Jesus. Well, you know, I think any database person would tell you that if you're doing things right, your, your performance tends to be limited by what you're logging to. And, uh, you know, so it's enormous in effect. I mean, and, and, you know, this where I think our thinking has been warped a little bit, like, uh, I can never remember the numbers, but, you know, you, like with the 3D cross point, you get down to the level that you're able to access smaller units, like 256 bytes, I think, in roughly a couple of microseconds. And uh, so that's, you know, and you, you compare that to even flash, where, you know, you're, you're tying, what, 100 times, 1,000 times more, you know. I mean, I often tell my students, you know, like, you can say a thousand times, but it, I have to translate this into saying, imagine you're on the skateboard and you go a thousand times faster, you know, on the skateboard. You're going five miles an hour, now you're going 5,000 miles an hour. I mean, these are just completely different worlds. And so that's where I think part of the thing that's happened with virtual memory, I mean, people have been on this track where we have virtual memory. It used to provide both expanded capacity as well as, as isolation. And we've given up on the expanded capacity sort of view because paging devices are so slow. And that's where I think if Intel plays it right, the 3D crosspoint technology is sort of transformative if it's used well to you know, basically be able to expand what you can do with virtual memory. But you know, these are orders of magnitude changes that are taking place. It's exciting. I hope I'm not going to offend, maybe I do hope I'll offend somebody. Why don't I be blatant here? You know, I, I, I don't have personal likes and dislikes, but I look at these things as saying, are we barking up the wrong tree? And when you look at hardware transactional memory, it's a neat idea, but it says to the processor cache, hey, you can be useful to me, right? You save a copy so we won't flush out of there until we're ready to commit. And that sounds good, until you come eyeball to eyeball the fact that a cache has limited associativity. And so you end up in this case where, and there's all sorts of reasons why, you know, a cache might, you know, there's all these cache conflicts that can occur. And so you, you then say to the cache, no, don't flush that out. And the cache says, I have to because somebody else needs to come in. And you know, the hardware is designed that way. So you're asking a cache to do something they can't do. And that's where you end up with this problem that 
you can't guarantee a transaction will commit. And this is a great experience years ago with a company where they were building a transactional thing. And I said, well, what's the, the largest number of memory references you can have in a transaction and guarantee that it will complete? And it took them, these architects took my question seriously for some reason. It took them weeks to figure this out. And it turned out the answer was two. And my theory is you have microtransactions like you know, double compare and swap or something or other that can work with that. But then there's millions of transactions. It's kind of like you know, if I look up, if I say I'm going to look up something in a data structure, and if not there, I'm going to add it. You say, well, if the add is the transactional portion, that's a microtransaction of tens of instructions. If it's the lookup, it can end up being millions of instructions. So on my theory, there's nothing in between. The trouble is the hardware stuff only handles the small case. And then the, the hardware people, yeah, you got me on a roll here. But the hardware guys always say, well, you, if it doesn't, you, know, you retry it a few times. If it doesn't work, you fail over to software. The trouble is that, as far as I can understand, the only failover to software is you have a global lock. And at the point you fail over to a global lock, where you have 64 cores going full blast, somebody fails over the global lock and grabs it. You know, suddenly you're running a serial program, and how you get out of this? So, I mean, I think we've. Well, I think we just. It's, it's got this fundamental problem that I don't see a solution to. And I can go on and on. I mean, factor in interrupts and TLB misses and on and on. It's just, you just can't make it scale. And this, so this works with terabytes of data. That, you know, two memory references. And otherwise, you're kind of in dicey territory. Sorry, Dan. You know, I'll shut up. Now that we've reached the moment where David is excited enough to throw his mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs>